Well, good morning. Welcome to equip the Equipping Hour. Today we start a new Equipping Hour, but let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for today. Thank you for, thank you for the rain. Such a contrast to where we live and what we normally see. You are the one that sends the rain and sends every blessing. You're the one who orchestrates all things, Lord. You ordain everything, and in that, by design, is our good, Lord. For, for those of us who are called, Lord, the, the ones who love you, called according to your purpose. Lord, your purpose has never failed. And I pray that in this equipping hour series, you would demonstrate that for us in the life of Joseph from your word. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, well, good morning. We start a new equipping hour series today. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. We're going to, for the next three weeks, look at the life of Joseph from Genesis 37 through 50. So in three weeks, we'll go ahead and cover 14 chapters of God's word. Okay. Uh, yes, that is a monumental task, but that's what we're going to do. If you would just look at your Bibles and if you've got um, an electronic copy, I'm not sure how you're going to do this, but just look at the material that's here. I want you to just with your fingers, look at Genesis 37 through 50 and see how much material is here. And then I want you to look down at Genesis 50, right at the end of the book, at 50 verse 20. This is, the, this is the text that you would remember. If you only remembered one thing from the Joseph narrative, this would be it. 50-20 says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Okay, so this is a theological truth that, uh, or, or a text that contributes to a huge theological truth of God's goodness, his providence, and all that he has for his people. And when we get to this text in three weeks, I want to make sure that when you walk away from that text, you have felt the full force of everything that has built up to that moment. And so what we're going to do for the next three weeks is, is go from building groundwork Okay, we're going to lay down, we're going to lay some groundwork in the life of Joseph, make some observations, and, and then finally get to, to that text. And so there's an upside and a downside to working through 14 chapters in three weeks. The upside is that you have the beginning of the story in mind when you get to the end of it. You can track those themes and track everything we're going to look at um, and, and, and not forget any of it. The Downside, of course, is we just don't have time to look at every detail in the text, and there is more that we can't look at than we can look at in a three-week period, but we'll do our best. The goal for this equipping hour is twofold. I want you to uh, remember these goals as we work through for the, uh, this text for the next two week, or three weeks. Goal number one is to equip you to, to think rightly about God's providence in your life, okay? To equip you to think rightly about God's providence in your life so that when difficulties come, your response to those difficulties is a godly one. And so we'll be using that word providence over and over again. So let's define it briefly. Providence is God's sovereignty and God's purposes put together. So if you're a math guy, like E equals MC squared, God's providence equals his sovereignty plus his purposes. Okay. So goal number one is to think rightly about God's providence. Goal number two is to get familiar again with the Joseph narrative, to put the story in its appropriate historical context, in its place in God's redemptive plan, and to see the expectations that the Old, Testament's, Old Testament saints bank their life on, what that means for us in principle, in practice, and in how we read our Bibles, that is to say hermeneutically. So to get the most out of this equipping hour, read, read, read. That, that's the plan. Um, if you can insert this section of your Bible into your reading plan for the next two weeks, you will benefit greatly from this series. If you read two chapters a day for the next two weeks, you'll get through the series twice. So go ahead and try to do that if you're able to do that. Read, read, read. 
I have a couple of resources uh, to, to give you. You have online, uh, available to you right now, uh, two resources. Number one is just a timeline. I'm sorry, uh, number one is the, no, I misspoke. Number one is just the outline to this series. So we're going to have three installments of this series, and we're simply going to walk through chapter by chapter by chapter, and these are simply headings for you to take notes around, and we'll be giving implications from the things that we see as we work through them. But here's the series outline. That's available to you. Go ahead and download that from the website. In addition to that is a timeline that we put together, and I know you can't read that on the screen, but it is a PDF it's online, and I really encourage you to go to that, download it, and just stick it in the front of your Bible. Just as a resource, these uh, dates and uh, events on the timeline are just simply taken out of the text and put into order with, with dates and events and, and whatnot. And there's some additional material you see there in the green. We'll get to that in a few minutes. So those are two resources for you. Go ahead and look at those, and, um, and we'll begin to work our way through these chapters so Joseph's life was filled with crisis. Joseph's life was filled with crisis. And, and in chapters 37 to, to 41, which is what we're going to look at today, God sends Joseph to Egypt. And the, what I want you to think about for your own life as we're just walking through the story is that God always has good purposes in your crisis moment. Okay? That's what I want you to hold on to from, from today's section of, of reading. God always has good purposes in your crisis moment. Crisis moments have got a way of shrinking the entire universe down and putting you right at the center of it, right? In other words, it's difficult to see past the immediate when trials are severe when they're prolonged or even unexpected, all of that happens in the Joseph narrative. So I want you to benefit from seeing how Joseph responds to those things. The natural inclination of, of a crisis moment is to respond to it by asking things like, is God in control? Is, does, does he know what he's doing? And you're saying, well, of course, we, we acknowledge those things. I am also not in a crisis moment. But you might ask questions like, how could he do this? Or, or why did God bring this particular difficulty to me? I was totally preparing for a different difficulty. And that one didn't come. And then this other one came through the side door. And I don't know how to deal with it. I've got questions. God's providence in the life of Joseph ought to shape our thinking so that when the inevitable trials do come, we can respond to them from a foundation of faith and not uncertainty. From a foundation of faith and not uncertainty. That's the goal. So let's get uh, to the text. And, and leading up to chapter 37, let's get our bearings. In chapter 37, you begin the Joseph narrative. And, and, and to get there, you have, of course, the life of the patriarchs. Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons, Joseph being the second youngest of those sons. The three most important characters in this story I want you to keep track of are Jacob, Joseph, and Judah. Those are the three that carry this narrative along. J Jacob had his sons over a 14-year period. Okay. When he was serving Laban for 20 years, and then one year later, after he left Laban, when he had Joseph, that same year, he departed and went back to the land of Canaan. And in that year that he left, Benjamin was born. So there's this 14-year period from the seventh year that he was working with for Laban uh, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the 14th year where he had, his, uh, where he had Benjamin. Okay, so let's get to our text. Chapter 37, Joseph is sold into slavery. And I want you to see from chapter 37 that faith in God's promises will carry you through the most difficult circumstances. Faith in God's promises will carry you through the most difficult circumstances. That formula has endured. It's really the same formula Joseph uh, 
applied to his life, and you can apply the same to yours. And so let's see how that shakes out. How did he get through all of these crises? Um, as we read through the text, of course, we can't read the entire 14 chapters, and so we're going to skip along like a rock on the water, but we are going to trace this story out. So begin with me in verse, uh, verses 3 through 5 in chapter 37. Now Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than all of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak with him on friendly terms. They could not speak with him peaceably. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And Joseph, being 17 years old, probably a little haughty, shares all of, that, all of his dream to his brothers, to his father eventually, and didn't, maybe his situational awareness wasn't quite developed. He, he has another dream, and he, he didn't learn from the response of his brothers the first time. He goes back, and he has another dream. His brothers said to him, verse 8, Are you actually going to reign over us? The point of his dreams were that he would be in charge. At some point, his brothers would bow down to him. In fact, everyone would bow down to him. And so verse 8, so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. He has another dream. And then verse 11, his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So hatred and jealousy had gripped his brothers. And the story progresses. The brothers are in the family business. They're all doing shepherding uh, on the hillside. And from Shechem, where uh, his father was, this is where home was at this point in the story, up at the higher elevation of, of Israel, Jacob sends Joseph to go check on his brothers. Jacob's, uh, Joseph is at home with Jacob, and he says, go check on your brothers, see what's up, bring me back a report. And so he goes down the slope to the north, finds them in Dothan, and here is how his brothers respond. Verse 18. When they saw him from a distance, probably in that very colored tunic coming down the slope, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said, here comes this dreamer. Now then, verse 20, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will see a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what comes of his dreams. So you have here their plans, their motivations. Yeah, thank you, Scotty. This is where we're at on the timeline. It would be beneficial to download it and hang on to this, but we are just going, going to reference it. Uh, so you have here their plans, their motivations. And all of the brothers are, if you can remember their ages, are in, in their 20s at this point. Joseph is 17. There's your, your marker. And 14 years of, or 13 years, not including Benjamin, uh, above that. So all, everyone's kind of in their 20s at this point. And you have their plans. And what follows is tragic and shameful. Murderous intent, deception, manipulation, sordid gain. The murderous intent plays a part in next week in chapters 42 through 44. So I want you to make note of that. The murderous intent of their brothers, of, of Joseph's brothers, is important for next week. Plan number one was to kill him and throw him into a hole in the ground. But Reuben intervenes, verse 21. But Reuben heard of this and rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood, throw him into the pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him that, and here's his purpose, that he might rescue him out of their hands and restore him to his father. So plan number two, don't kill him. Just throw him in a hole and leave him for dead. And before you say, okay, well, go Reuben, and you fist pump Reuben's uh, uh, rescue, just keep in mind that, that Reuben at this point, just skip down to verse 29, when after he is sold, Reuben uh, departs the scene for a moment, comes back, J Joseph is in the hole, and he returns to the pit, and Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments and returned to his brothers and said, the boy's not here, as for me, what am I going to do? Reuben is at the center of Reuben's thinking. So Reuben, his plan to rescue him was more than likely um, a plan to go steal that favoritism from Jacob and 
and get himself into a favorable position with dad. And so uh, not necessarily a hero, although that was his, that's what he thought he might be. So Joseph is uh, verse 23 through the beginning of 25. Let's read it. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped him of his tunic, which is probably all he had on. That very colored tunic, which is on him. And they took him and threw him into a pit. Now the pit was empty without water. And then what did the brothers do? Not sure if you could do this, but they just sat down and had a meal. Now, I want you to get the picture of what's going on here because this would be the last interaction Joseph has with his brothers for 22 years. And so next week, especially the response to how Joseph works through the later interaction with his brothers, keeping this in mind is important. Their murderous intent. So naked, bloodied, broken, perhaps. And I'm not sure how deep a pit would have to be for a 17-year-old to not be able to get out of. Probably hurt. This is probably a dry well. But instead of leaving him, they pull him out of the pit at Judah's suggestion, and they sell him to a caravan of traders, uh, merchants, on their way down to Egypt. So the, this traumatic conclusion of Joseph's relationship plays into how he will respond when he does see them 22 years later. Story per progressives. Um, and they go back to their father and they represent, their representation of Joseph's absence is consistent with their murderous intent. Uh, if you look at verses 31, so they took Joseph's tunic, slaughtered a male goat, dipped it in blood, took it to their father. And then verse 33, he, then he examined it and said, this is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes and put on sackcloth on his loins and mourned for him many days. Then all the sons, all of his sons and all of his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for his son. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, the uh, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. Joseph mourns the death of his son. And meanwhile, Joseph is sold to one of the highest ranking officials in the king's court. This would have been about a 360-mile journey for them. And so probably about two weeks to get there. And in that two weeks, you can imagine what this was like. He was in a chain gang, Psalm 105 suggests. And so everything was torn from his, his relationships, his resources, protection, comfort. And the only hope that remained for Joseph were the irrevocable promises of God. And it can be easy to forget how much God had disclosed to the patriarchs by this time in history. So by the time Joseph was 17, the entire Abrahamic covenant had been communicated and had been saturated in that family for years, generations as a matter of fact. Uh, on the timeline, if, uh, if you can zoom out, Scotty, to the big timeline... Uh, in addition to events in the life of Joseph and Jacob, the, the, the biggest one, um, I know you're not going to be able to read this, but in the green, what I've done for you is listed out all of the promises that God has uh, communicated, that he's disclosed, all of the plans and expectations he had disclosed at, by certain times. And so you see that first green line. I know you can't read this, but that first green line that goes up to the main timeline there at the top, that's about the time Joseph was sold into slavery. And you can see all of that green space uh, to your left and all of the promises that had been delivered to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And so I'm just going to skim through some of these and give you some citations. And I know that you're familiar with them. When Abram was first called out of 
from Ur at 75 years old, God promised to him saying, I will make you into a, a great nation. I will make your name great. All the families of the earth will be blessed. And there's even in the language, a distinction between the land that he would give him, not just the families of that land, but all the earth would be blessed through him. All of the land of Canaan would belong to him and his descendants. All the land that he can see to his descendants forever. His descendants would outnumber the dust of the earth. So this Abrahamic covenant is found in Genesis 12 and 13. Then to Abram after the war of the kings and the blessing from Melchizedek before Abram was 86 years old. Again, your descendants will outnumber the stars. He promises once again the possession of the land of his sojournings. God promises to Abram that your descendants, this is very important, will be enslaved as foreigners for 400 years in a land not their own, followed by a great deliverance. That goes along with all of the land promises, the seed promises, descendant promises. And at that point, of course, that had not happened yet. When God changed Abram's name to Abraham at 99 years old, God established a covenant with him by promising that he would be the father of nations. Again, the land of his sojournings as an everlasting possession. That Yahweh would be the God of his descendants. And he adds in Genesis 17 that his covenant would be established through Isaac. And when that's communicated, Isaac is not even born. So this covenant is promised to Abraham before Isaac is born, before he's even named. These are irrevocable promises. When Abraham offered Isaac at um, probably about 125 years old, the angel of Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, communicated in Genesis 22 that God would multiply Abraham's descendants, plural, as the stars of the heaven. And one particular descendant, singular, new disclosure, would possess the gate of his enemies, of that descendant's enemies. That's the idea of dominion. And all of the nations of the earth would be blessed by him, that particular descendant. And so as Abraham is receiving promises from God, they're developing further and further and further to paint a bigger, more full picture of God's intentions for his people through Abraham. And these intentions were well known. When Abraham seeks a wife for Isaac in Genesis 24, 25, at about 140 years old, Abraham recounts to his servant the promises of God. And Rebekah's brothers, Abraham, or Isaac's future wife, bless Rebekah, recounting the same promises. These were not secret promises. These were well-known promises. And again, there is that promise that one particular descendant would have dominion and no enemies. That's in uh, chapter 24, 60. When Isaac becomes the father of Jacob and Esau at 60 years old, God promises that Jacob's house would prevail over Esau's. And when God appeared to Isaac on two occasions, he again reestablishes some of the same truth, the land, the descendants, the promise to multiply descendants. And then when God appeared to Jacob in a dream in Genesis 28, that the land, again, this is when he was in Bethel, would become his and his descendants forever. That his descendants would migrate from, from that place into every direction. And that all the families of the earth would be blessed by him. When Jacob prays before meeting Esau, after he'd not seen his brother, he predicates his prayer on God's promises saying that God had promised to multiply his descendants. And so give me a favorable meeting with his brother. And certainly he did. And then one more promise, uh, again, recounted to Jacob at Bethel, that nations and kings would come forth from him and that the land given to Abraham 
and Isaac would be given to his descendants. There it is tied all together. The Abrahamic covenant disclosed over 10 occasions with all that detail. And this was before Joseph was even born. And so when Joseph had everything stripped from him, the only thing he had was God's promises. And that's why you can mark this down. We've been here together before, but Psalm 105, 17 through 20 is a divine commentary on the man, Joseph, banking his life on God's promises. It, said that, it says that when he, was, when he was shackled with a fetter and his neck entered an iron collar, from that time until the time came to pass, that is contextually when he stood before Pharaoh at 30 years old, for that 13-year period from the time he was put into shackles in a chain gang until the time he stood before Pharaoh to carry out all of what God had for him, the word of Yahweh shaped him. The word of Yahweh tested him. The word of Yahweh refined him. This is all he had. And praise God, because that shaped the man that we're going to continue to learn about. Okay, here's what we're going to do with chapter 38. I so wanted to go through chapter 38 in detail. It's in, in place. So this is the story of Judah and Tamar. And I'm just going to point you to the first verse. And then if we've got time, we'll come back to it. Okay. The events of chapter 38 are happening concurrently with this Joseph narrative. So chronologically, it's not going to throw us off to get to it at the end or even next week. But I just want you to notice, and it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite. His name is Hariah. So during that, during the, the, the period, I just want to give you a, a, a time marker. When it says during that time, Judah and Tamar took place you have a 22 year window to work with. Your limit is when Judah and his family come to Egypt to see uh, w with Jacob and all of his descendants. Judah and Tamar couldn't have taken place past that. However, 22 years is tight. And what the text seems to indicate, uh, or at least does not pr uh, prohibit, is that, the, that Judah had left his father's home and gone and began his own family that probably happened before Joseph was thrown in a hole. Although Judah, of course, is a part of the Jacob story and it's a key part of, of throwing him in the hole in the ground. And so when you look at the geography of where these men were shepherding, there's no limits to that. So at that time, at that time covers everything else we're going to look at today or for the rest of this week, uh, this week and next. Okay, let's jump to chapter 39. This is Joseph's 13-year path from slave to ruler. And what I want you to remember is that God himself, I'm sorry, that's the main point of 38. God himself will bring his promises to pass. To pass. The main point that I want you to take away today is that your circumstances are no obstacle for God's promises. So as you read chapters 39 through 40, you just need to be reminded that your obstacles that you cannot see over, you cannot see around, they are no obstacle for God and his purposes. So even though, even though uh, Joseph had been kidnapped, sold, he wasn't anyone's favorite anymore, no advocates, no resources, a foreigner, in a very real sense, God took everything away from him so that he would only depend on God's promises. Look at verse uh, one through three. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, the Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Yahweh was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that Yahweh was with him and how Yahweh caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So the captain of the bodyguard, this is where Joseph lives now. He seems to be uh, over all of the security and personal welfare of Pharaoh. And so the other characters in the story, the chief jailer, the jail, the cook, the cupbearer, they were all under the administration of the uh, captain of the guard, what's translated the captain of the guard. But Joseph worked for him personally. He was his personal slave, and he excelled in every obligation and eventually oversaw his entire estate. 
Of course, this is the best move that Potiphar could have made. Look at verse 5 through the beginning of 6. It came about from that time that he made him overseer. Now, probably about a year and a half to two years had passed. He, in order to have everything in the house and the field prosper, you need some seasonality. And so after he was brought in on the lower rungs of the ladder in his estate, everything that he saw, uh, went, or everything that Joseph did went well for him. And so the Egyptian put him over all of his house. And so Yahweh blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus, Yahweh's blessing was upon all that he owned, the Egyptian that is, in the house and in the field. And so he left everything that he owned in Joseph's charge. Now this went on for about eight to 10 years. If you want to get a snapshot of that timeline, you can see where this takes place. So for about eight to 10 years, he's in Potiphar's house, but Potiphar had a promiscuous wife and she was watching this young man grow in stature and influence. She tries to seduce Joseph at about the age of 25 to 27, probably about 26 years old. And Joseph becomes the example for every young man that follows with the opportunity to follow through on his lust. Now, Joseph didn't have Proverbs 5. He didn't have Proverbs 7. He didn't have the Mosaic law. He didn't have the Sermon on the Mount, 1 Corinthians, 1 Peter. He didn't have these things. But he knew the character of Yahweh, and he could discern good and evil. Look how he responds, verse, uh, into verse 9. How could I do, or how, how then could I do such great evil and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her because uh, he did not listen to her to lay beside her or to be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men were in the household. In verse 12, she caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment there in her hand and fled and went outside. Joseph's value system was pretty straightforward. Don't, don't sin. Don't sin against the God of my hope. Okay? So he leaves Potiphar's house, and, and the wife realizes, okay, this is never going to happen. And so she does what false victims do and accumulate advocates. And verse 14 says, she called to the men of her house and says, see, he, that's her husband, has brought a Hebrew into us to make sport of us. And he came into me to lie with me, and I screamed. The guys were like, I don't know, I didn't hear a scream. But now Potiphar is in a bind. I mean, Joseph is a cash register for this guy, right? Joseph's making life easier, but he's a foreigner after all, and these optics aren't great. And so he comes home. Potiphar had plenty to be angry at, but nothing seems to stick with Joseph. I want you to see this from the rest of this text. Here's his integrity. He was above reproach, even in the face of these, these accusations, some of the worst accusations, and, and his integrity was intact. Potiphar could have just put him to death, but, but he didn't. Look at verse 20. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. But Yahweh was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Now, I want to keep our focus on Joseph and his character through this, but let's just go ahead and check in on our timeline. Jo uh, chapter 20 covers the cupbearer and the baker who were sent to prison for offending the king. And, and uh, at the king who was offended was probably Amenhat II, and his son was likely the one who put him in jail, Sesostris II. They were co-regents at this time. 
Joseph, at this point, was 28 years old. We're certain of that. So 28 years old, here's another surprise, and now he's in prison. I want you to consider Joseph's reputation. He was in the same prison that he formerly oversaw on the half of Potiphar. See, see, he oversaw all of Potiphar's house. And in the text, you see that the prison itself was in Potiphar's house. And the chief jailer continues to play a role. Look at verse 40, or chapter 40, verse 3. So after the chief baker and the cupbearer offend the king, he puts them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, the jail, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. Potiphar couldn't bring himself to execute Joseph. He couldn't bring himself to totally do away with him. Joseph was far too important. And even though he's in prison, he never really leaves Potiphar's house until he becomes the ruler of Egypt. And, and usually, as you know, when, when an authority figure winds up in, in prison, it, it doesn't go well for that man. But not in Joseph's case. And it wasn't magical that nothing stuck to him. He just honored Yahweh, honored the God of his hope, and walked in integrity. So verse 4, the captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, the cupbearer and the baker. It's not the chief jailer that assigns Joseph to these men. It's his former boss or his current boss, his current uh, master, the captain of the bodyguard. And Joseph uh, saw to their affairs, took care of them. And they, the, the, the two men, were in confinement for days. My text in the NAS is for some time. That indicates a lengthy uh, time. The word there is just days. And so I do think this whole story takes place uh, fairly quick. And then what follows is the account of Joseph giving these men prophetic interpretations of their dreams, which is the catalyst for him getting out of prison. Verses 6 through 8, I want you to read this. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. And he asked Potiphar's officials who were there with him in confinement in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? And they said to him, we've had a dream and there's no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. As a theological rabbit trail, we don't have time for it, but just, I just can't resist reminding us that the interpretation of Scripture belongs to the one who delivered it, to God himself. Okay? And I know that their dreams are not Scripture, but everything God discloses, the meaning of what he discloses, belongs to him who disclosed it. Joseph was so certain of what God had disclosed through the dream, that when he sees things go well for the cupbearer, he, he makes plans. Look at verse 14. After he interprets the dream and tells him what it is, he says in verse 14, only keep me in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me a kindness and by mentioning me to Pharaoh. Get me out of this house. Now, I, I'm, I'm glad. Oh, and then, of course, he goes on to say, in fact, he was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and he's done nothing wrong to wind up in this dungeon. And, and I'm glad that this, these, these words are here, because it reminds us in this excellent life that Joseph lived, that you don't have to like your circumstances to be faithful in them. In fact, the, 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 where we might be the most faithful are, are in the most uncomfortable circumstances. And, jo- and Joseph acknowledges that, hey, I don't want to be here. I don't like this. This is hard. This is a trial. I don't want to be here. Do what you can to get me out of this circumstance. Is that sinful of him? No, not at all. And certainly his prayers would have been crafted around that desire, but you can just see his humility in submitting to God's purposes because that's what he banked his life on. His entire hope was banked on God's purposes. And of course, everything that Joseph had predicted, interpreted, came to pass just as he said they would. Look at verse 21. This is what happened. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office, and he, uh, and, he, and he, the chief cupbearer, put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged 
the chief baker, just as Joseph had interpreted to them. And yet, despite the request, the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And again, we could say, oh, bad guy. But it just wasn't time yet. It just wasn't time yet. Had Joseph been let out of prison then through some strange request of a man who was let out of prison and offended his master, and then the master says, okay, you can let Joseph go? What happens to the rest of the story? It's just not time yet. But it did become time. In two years, look at verse 41.1. Now it happened at the end of two full years from that event that Pharaoh had a dream. Okay, so now we are in chapter 41 and we're going to observe Joseph as a ruler. The one who was put in place to rule. Okay, and what I want you to take away from, from this chapter is that discernment accompanies faith in God's future promises and humility in present circumstances. So if, if your faith is cast on God's future promises and your humility is such that you can come under present circumstances, you make room for discernment, for wisdom. That's, how you, that, that's the place you want to respond from. So, uh, chapter, uh, verses 1 through 8 outline the prayer. I'm sorry, the prayer, the, the dream that, that Pharaoh has. Moses gives us a shorthand version of this, this dream. It's recited twice. We're not going to read it twice, but I will we'll read what happened here. Verse 2, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh. This is Pharaoh's dream. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time. Behold, seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke. Behold, it was a dream. And here we go. In the morning, his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men, and Pharaoh told his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret the, the dreams for Pharaoh. This was uh, certainly Sesostris the second who had this dream. This was uh, the younger of the co-regents. By this time, Sesostris the second was on the throne. And in uh, and so they so they they sent for for Joseph. Just look at verses fourteen through sixteen. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes and came to Pharaoh, it's likely that his master personally brought Joseph to his master Pharaoh. He said, "I've had a dream, and I've." And I've heard that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh and said, it is not me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So in verses 17 through 24, Pharaoh's autobiographical account of what Moses gave us shorthand is repeated with some added detail that just contributes to the severity of what's to follow, of what's being disclosed. And Joseph responds in verses 25 through 31 by saying a famine is coming. A famine is coming. There will be seven years of abundance and seven years of famine. And this is where Joseph's discernment comes in. I want you to take note of it, not the inter interpreting of dreams, um, but how he responds to what God has disclosed. Now, he could have put himself at the center of this and said, okay, I've, I've done my job. I've told you what you want to know. And he's finally got the audience that could get, get him out of his circumstance. But instead of putting himself at the center of his universe, he, he actually responds by saying, okay, God has disclosed something. We must respond to what he has disclosed. <clears throat> 
Skip down to chapter, uh, verse 38. After Joseph had described what was going to take place, um, I'm sorry, back up and let's look at uh, verse 34. He says, this is what we've got to do. He, answered the un- he answers the unstated question and says, left by, by saying, well, what do we do about it? And Pharaoh, he says, Pharaoh, take action and appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce, that is a 20% flat tax on all the produce of the land in the seven years of abundance. Then let, him, let them gather all the food for these good years that are coming and store the grain up for food in the cities, plural, that's important, under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. That's also important. Let the food become a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which will occur in the land of Egypt. And Potiphar, among the rest of the, I just want to make note that Potiphar, one of the chief officials of Pharaoh, is amongst the rest of the advisors that responds by saying, Sounds good. This would have been Potiphar's opportunity to say, whoa, 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 whoa. I've seen this movie before. I know how it ends. This guy's got a silver tongue, but he's a little shady. Hey, he didn't do that because just nothing sticks to this guy because of the integrity that Joseph walked in. And so now Joseph's job after, after Pharaoh puts him in charge of all of the land of Egypt, his job is to go execute on all of the wisdom that he just dispensed. Let's build forts. Let's make them granaries. Let's fortify them. And let's make sure there's one in every city. Now, I, I remember um, uh, in, I, I, until I read the story in detail, and, and looked at those details, I, I remember thinking, what would that have been like? You've got Joseph and, and big granary behind him. This was a massive undertaking. There was not one granary. There was a granary in every city in the land. And not only that, the land had to produce even more than it was before. And so he's got two tasks at hand. Pharaoh puts him in charge. He does three things for him. Joseph uh, is given the title that is, uh, indicates he's second in command, as you know. And his job is to put these plans into action. Pharaoh does three things for him. He gives Joseph command of every resource he has. He tours the country with Joseph, puts Joseph in his second chariot, and says, bow the knee. And he says, no one will raise a hand or foot in the country unless he's got permission from you. And then he provides Joseph with a wife. And so armed with resource, authority, a household of his own, he got to work. I want you to notice something in verse 45. Then Pharaoh named Joseph zaphnath paneah And this is a phonetic representation of an Egyptian name, an Egyptian word from the Middle Kingdom period. And in the margin of the NAS, uh, you see the note, It probably means, not a lot of margin notes say probably. This one says probably means he lives. And the idea of life is in that cognate. The the best scholarship that I've found on the translation of this name from from the Middle Kingdom Egyptian language to the Hebrew text represented in English means he who sets life in order. He who sets life in order. And that is most certainly what this uh, Egyptian name represents. And I can't help but just notice that you don't have to turn there, we don't have time, but this name is a stark contrast illustration from what James warns us against in James 3.16, where he says, for where jealousy, selfish ambition exist, jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Joseph had opportunities to be jealous, to to be selfish, to have selfish ambition. These things were served on a silver platter to Joseph all the time. But he doesn't give into those things. God's future promises were more important to him than 
things that were in the moment. His hope was not in the moment. His hope was in God's future promises and his humility under authority gave him the room he needed to act with wisdom and discernment. And you can do the very same thing. So, so future hope, present humility gives you the room to respond to crisis with wisdom and discernment. Okay, we've got 10 minutes. The task at hand for Joseph, I would like to just paint you a picture of what it was that he did. Okay, his task was to amass nearly a decade's worth of grain supply. Okay, that, that is a huge undertaking. He knew how long the famine would be, but he did not know the geogra- geographical scope of the famine. And one of the reasons that Pharaoh probably responded with such urgency is because famines were not unheard of. In fact, Sesostris II's grandfather experienced, up until that point, the worst famine that we have from the uh, Egyptian record uh, that had ever been on record. And so the famine, uh, as, it ind- as it's indicated from the text, when Joseph says, let, let us do these things so that the famine doesn't ruin the land. That's what happens when a famine hits, especially a desert environment. Okay, and so he responded quickly, and so jo- Joseph's job was to do two things primarily, expanding farmland and building granaries. And so here I'm going to point towards some archaeological things that we have found um, under the reign of Sesostris the second and third. And this is uh, what we know from the archaeological record, but we also know from the biblical record that Joseph was in charge for all of this period. And so, uh, just to give you an idea, Scotty, if you can get me to, um, to the first, first map. Egypt. You're familiar with it. You have the Nile represented there in green, and then I've got an arrow in a circle. So the arrow would have been where the administration of Joseph, uh, Joseph's time would have taken place. There just before the Nile Delta opens up. And then the, what's circled there is the Fayum Basin. And the canals that had to be built um, had to make sure that they could bring water from the Nile, flood the basin, and then also drainage canals, you can go to the next slide, had to be put on the other end of those things and so, so that you didn't drain the, uh, so you didn't flood the land that you're trying to uh, bring produce from. And so uh, that is exactly what we find in the archaeological record and the canals that were built were huge. There were, there, were, there, were, there were many of these canals. What Joseph did, or what you would read in scholarship, the Sesostris II did during his period was expand farmland by 112,000 acres. Okay, so that's roughly, to give you an idea of how big that is, that is from uh, the 10 and the 60, clear out to Apache Junction, down to uh, Queen Creek, Riggs Road, all the way back to I-10 and back up again. That's about 110, 115,000 acres. That is the land that Joseph cultivated. He said, okay, we have to add land. Now, in, in, in Egypt, you've got the Nile River, and you can just see to the, to the west, you have a, a handful of miles of farmable land, and then just like a threshold to a door, it just stops. And you have the same thing on the other side in some places. And so he expanded the farmland, uh, in areas where it wasn't used before that. And then with the system of water supply and drainage, uh, you would have been able to produce uh, more than two crops a year, like, more than likely. And so the, gr- the ground was useful year-round. Okay. And, and so this is what Joseph did. And you, there's an evidence of his work still existing now. It's, it's quite remarkable. The granaries that he said, let's build forts, fortify them. Of course, you'd have to fortify them because you've got the most valuable commodity in in the world at that point. The entire Fertile Crescent went through this uh, uh, famine. And so he built fortified city. uh, Thank you. He built fortified uh, granaries. And these are just some we've, uh, we've unearthed about, I don't know, 25 or 30 of these. It seems like I kind of ran out of names looking at the sites. Here's an example of how they were spread out. You can see the scale there is 100 kilometers, I believe. And so they were kind of everywhere. And that blown up portion is just one area where there's more population. And so just as the text says, 
let Pharaoh store of grain in every city. And that's what he did. Um, Archaeologists have excavated at least a dozen of these granaries. And I'm going to answer the question why you haven't heard about all this. But uh, these are dated, um, go to the first photo that you have. So here's an example of one of the granaries. And you're like, wow, that's black and white, not very good. Well, that's because this granary is covered by a lake right now. That, take, that was photos taken in 1967 before uh, Lake Nassar was, uh, uh, and, and the Aswan Dam was, was built in the 70s. And so there are several of these. These date back to Sesostris II's reign. Really, no one argues about that. What they argue about is whether or not the Bible is true. Okay? And so when you see things like this, go ahead and look at the next one. It's quite remarkable. These are, these are huge facilities. And there was one in, in every city. So conventional scholarship can't really answer the question why these are so big. The average fortified granary, the average fortified granary from this period was able to store enough food to feed 8,000 people. Okay, that's the average size of one of these granaries that were built during Sesostris II's reign when Joseph was uh, prime minister. But the population from that time period around the granaries, the largest one I could find was 1,200 people. Quite interesting. And so that's why we see in the text that in verse uh, 48, it says, so he, Joseph, gathered all the food in these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt and placed the food in the cities. And he placed in every city, the food from its own surrounding field. Thus, Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. There's a, a little trick that, that the world system of darkness and the devil uses to discredit the synchronization of the biblical record and the historical record. And it's just to say, sure, those are granaries. But the Bible, all those events, sure, those happen too, much, much later. And so it's, it's a common trick, right? You hear, you, you see things that are clearly evident that, that something was formed by water, like the Grand Canyon. And you say, gosh, that happened very rapidly. No, no, millions of years. And you look in the historical record, and similar, similar things happen. So scholarship might say, yeah, that's a granary. That was built during the time that you say it was built. Uh, but the biblical record, we, we think that all that stuff happened um, much later, and there's no evidence for it, therefore it didn't happen. <laughs> it's, just, it's just silly. It doesn't make any sense. So the rest of chapter 41 just gives you an account of what happens in the land. Joseph uh, uh, receives two sons from the Lord. We'll talk about those the next time we're together. Go ahead and continue to read this Joseph story, all 14 chapters, and we will pick up here where we've left off next week. You are dismissed and we'll see you for main service in a few minutes.